Let me pray. If you have a Bible, turn to Psalm 121. So if you have a Bible, open up to Psalm 121. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for our salvation. Thank you for dying in our place as our substitute. Holy Spirit, thank you for inspiring the Bible. Lord, we pray this morning that we would see you in a greater way, that our eyes would be opened wider to who you are and how much you love us. Lord, we pray specifically that we would be amazed by your nearness and your protective care for all of us. We look to you, ask for your help, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as many of you know, I am an avid cross-country fan. My, my kids all were runners. Two of them still are runners. So every fall, if you want to know where the Ryer family is on a Saturday, we are found at a cross-country course somewhere in Pennsylvania or Ohio. If you've ever been to a cross-country race, especially a large invitational, it's hundreds of runners starting a starting line, gun goes off, and then they take off. And when they take off, usually adrenaline is high, so they don't feel much discomfort. But inevitably, a mile or two into the race, the pain and discomfort begins to settle in. And my son Adam's coach, Coach Peters, is notorious for saying two words, and you hear it shouted across a cross-country course. And these two words are this, eyes up, eyes up. And what he's doing, as the runners get tired, they begin to look down at the ground, and it affects their performance as a runner. So no matter where we are, whether it's Hershey, Pennsylvania, or somewhere in Ohio, and when we don't even see him, we hear his piercing voice, eyes up, eyes up. And what that does to the athlete, it jars their attention, especially coming from him because he is their coach. And their eyes go up, and their running gets better. Well, this morning, we're going to read and study Psalm 121, and it really is a call, spiritually speaking, to lift our eyes up to the Lord. Look with me as I read Psalm 121, verses 1 through 8. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep, will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you going out and you're coming in from this time forth and forevermore. This morning, the psalmist is calling out to us, eyes up, lift your eyes. The, the main idea from this passage that emerges is, is something like this. Since the Lord is our hope and our help, we must look to him for his watchful care and protection. Since the Lord is our hope and our help, we must look to him for our care and protection. We're going to see three points emerge from this psalm today, and the points are this. Point one is we must look to the Lord for our care and protection. We must look to the Lord for our care and protection. Point number two, we can be confident in the Lord's protective care. Not only do we look, but we can be confident in the Lord's protective care. Point three, we can be certain of the Lord's protective care all of our days. We can be certain of the Lord's protective care all of our days. First truth we're going to look at from verses 1 through 4 is this. We must look to the Lord for our care and our protection. Look at verse 1 again. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. 
He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. Before we get into the details of these verses, just want to set uh, the stage for the book of Psalms to get us oriented with the kind of writings the Psalms are. So Psalms is a collection of 150 poems and songs compiled by King David, also written by numerous other authors. Uh, Many of them are labeled, if you look in your Bible, you can see who wrote them. Some are anonymous. The one we're looking at this morning is anonymous. So we don't know who wrote this, and they, they fall under the genre of wisdom literature. So you think of Proverbs, the Song of Solomon, and uh, Psalms falls into that category. Why that's important is because understanding the kind of writing is affects how we interpret it. So most of the Psalms are poetic in nature. So they're going to use a lot of similes, a lot of metaphors, a lot of vivid imagery to teach us truths about the Lord. And this Psalm is no exception to that. One of the things that this psalm in particular does that you can see in other psalms is, is, is kind of a big word, but it's something called step parallelism. So it's basically the psalmist, the poet, will write an idea, who will introduce an idea. They don't come up with a parallel idea, but it's a little different and it's progressive. It's growing in nature. And so as we go through this psalm, we'll see we're going to go up a staircase of ideas that will teach us more and more about the Lord. So back to the passage. We must look to the Lord for our care and protection. We must look to the Lord. Verse 1 says, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? So if in your Bible, it probably says this is a, a song or a psalm of ascent. And what uh, commentators think that that means is when the Israelites would make their annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem, they had a long journey. And as they walked, they saw physical hillsides um, along the way. And this is one of the psalms that they would have sang along the way. So the, the, the poet, the author, is using the imagery of physical hillsides to draw our attention spiritually to look upward and outward to the Lord. Psalm 121, like Psalm 23 and others is often um, referred to as a trust psalm. So you'll notice as we go along, there's not a lot that the psalmist is calling us to do other than really believe what he's writing and respond with faith. So it is a trust psalm. So a question for us, question for you, is have you functionally lost sight of the Lord? Are there times where the pressures and cares of life and uh, just the weights of your, maybe your own struggles, the weights of, of the struggles around you, that you're like the tired runner where your, your head goes down. You're, you go inward. You lose sight of the Lord who has saved you. Well, if that's the case, you're in good company today because the psalmist would say, eyes up, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? See, God alone is the hope and trust of believers in Jesus Christ. But if we're honest, if we're really brutally honest, functionally at times, we just completely lose sight of the Lord. We, we just cannot see. And so we need to be jarred back by Spirit and by His Word. Now verse 2 is filled with, with encouragement. The psalmist is calling us to lift our eyes To who? The maker of heaven and earth. My help, verse 2 says, comes from the Lord. The Lord who did what? Who made heaven and earth. That's to jar our mind and our attention back to the first two chapters of the Bible. Genesis 1 and 2, where God begins. There's no cows or dinosaurs. There's no ocean. There's no moon. There's no sun. And so God just begins to create and speak. That's the one who is our help, the maker of heaven and earth. So God is trustworthy. He is competent. So if you're wondering, can he help you? Can he help me? 
Oh, surely he can help us because he made heaven and earth. It's not, a, it's not an issue of competency or ability. I want you to imagine this. Imagine that you are an architect. You're both an architect and a builder. You have these skills. And depending on how you're gifted right now, that might be a, a lot of imagination. But you suddenly have the ability to build and design, and you're wealthy. And so you make it your life's work to build this beautiful mansion for your children, your grandchildren, and all who would bear your name that come after you. So you spend years of resources and energy designing and building. You build it with your own hands. Then the day comes where the family moves in. First your kids, then their kids, and then their kids' kids. And inevitably, as all buildings go, it it at times has problems. And so your kids or your grandkids will call you for help. And because you've built the building, because you know the building, and because you did so motivated out of love, you are eager every time to respond to the request. Well, how much more so for God, who made heaven and earth and made Adam and Eve, made humans as the pinnacle of his creation? He is so competent to answer our call and to help us. But the question at times is, well, he might be able, but does he actually care? What's his motivation? Is he as eager as it seems to be in this this psalm? How do we know? Well, as we're reading the psalms through a New Testament lens, the clearest way we know is through the cross of Jesus Christ. Consider this. This is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. See, it's in God sending his son Jesus, fully God, fully man, who died on the cross as our substitute, paying for our sins, that we know not only is he competent to help and save, but he is willing and eager and motivated with love. Christian songwriter Mark Altrogi wrote this memorable line in the song entitled, I Look to the Cross. It's one of my favorite songs. How do I know you love me? I look around and see. The sunshine, the rain, the wind and the trees. But should these gracious tokens all fade from my sight? I won't doubt your love, for I fix my eyes. I look to the cross where I most clearly see your awesome love displayed for me. For even when I was dead in sin, you died for me. See, that's how we know not only is God competent to help and care for us, but he is motivated by unimaginable love. Next we will see in verses 3 and 4, we must lift our eyes to the Lord's watchful care, his watchful care, his intentional care, his being very mindful to care for us kind of care. Look at verses 3 and 4. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. I like the idea that emerges from this these two verses of watchful care, attentive care. See, if we are looking to him for our help and our hope, then we're less likely to lose our footing. A couple winters ago, my neighbor, Dr. Jacobson, um, was getting older, and he he has a very large driveway with a very steep part of his driveway. So myself and my, my kids went over to help him shovel. But he was out there too, and so I'm shoveling him on the steepest part of the driveway, and I'm losing my footing. I'm slipping. And he's about 25 years older than me, and he's not having any trouble at all. I'm thinking, well, what's wrong with this picture? And then I look down at his feet, and strapped to his snow boots were metal cleats. So he had these metal cleats that kept him um, to have traction on a slippery slope. Well, in the, spiritually speaking, when we are looking upward and outward to the Lord, and we are responding in faith, in trust, who God is, 
and how much he cares for us, it's the equivalent of putting those metal cleats on our feet. We have traction for difficult times. Uh, the psalmist in Psalm 119 writes this, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. See, when we are in God's word and we are believing God's word, we can have traction when others don't because we, we are looking upward and outward toward the Lord. The Lord's watchful care, it is relentless. And we can read verse 4 and sort of glaze by it, but if you stop and think about what is really being said in verse 4, it's actually incredible. Verse 4 says, Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And through the the New Testament lens, it's not a stretch to say he who keeps the church, he who keeps the gathered people of God, he never sleeps nor slumbers. Charles Spurgeon said this about this verse, this consoling truth must be repeated. It's too rich to be dismissed in a single line. This truth that our God never gets tired. Our God never falls asleep. Our God never is off duty. That is meant to motivate us. This might be a discouraging statistic, but if you are the average human being, you will spend 26 years of your life sleeping. 26 years of our lives, if we live to an average age, uh, are spent really doing nothing. Just sound asleep. Well, the Lord is not like that. The one we trust in is not like that. That's why it's foolish to trust in other people or other things that are not the Lord. He alone is the one who watches over us, who keeps his eye on us at all times. In his commentary, James Montgomery Boyce said this about Psalm 121. He tells a story about Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was a wanted, marked man. And a person asked the Greek general, how in the world can you sleep so soundly? Alexander the Great had many enemies, and yet when he would go to bed, he would go sound asleep. Here was his answer. He replied, Parmenio. Parmenio is his faithful guard. He said, my faithful guard, Parmenio, is always watching. I trust him, and so I'm able to sleep soundly. So, think about yourself right now. Are you fearful this morning? Did you wake up anxious? Are you worried maybe that you won't make it across the finish line to the Lord? Are you worried about children and grandchildren? Are you worried about finances? Are you worried about a combination of all those things wrapped together? Fix your eyes, lift your eyes to the one who never sleeps nor never sleeps slumbers. You are under his caring, protective watch. Second point, we can be confident of the Lord's protective care. So it's one thing to know it, it's another to be confident, to rest in it. Verse 5 and 6, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Now, we live in the year 2023, so when we think of the, the, the sun in the Middle East um, at day where it's scorching hot, we, we would go, and if we were in a car or in a home, we'd probably have air conditioning on. Uh, but this is, this is a psalm that was written to people traveling. And so the, the desert heat was a serious threat to their livelihood. And so the, the sun by night is not going to strike us. He uses it as a metaphor of the dangers of the day. And then the moon by night, the nighttime had a whole other set of challenges and, and things that would threaten the well-being of the Israelites. His point is this, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. So the threats of day, you picture like this giant umbrella over top of you that the Lord casts to protect you, to watch over you. And it's the same at night. Whatever dangers would come, we call out to the one who never sleeps, never slumbers, 
and casts his shade over top of us. This imagery reminds me of maybe the attentiveness of a, a mom with her firstborn infant. Night and day. Nobody needs to tell her what to do. Nobody, the, she doesn't need to read a book to know, like, if you hear them cry, you should respond. You should check on them at night. You should check them in the day. If they're hungry, you should feed them. No, she has all these intuitive responses to care for a child. Well, that's how the Lord is. He has all these intuitive responses because of who he is. All-powerful, all-wise, all-loving, all-knowing, and near to his people. You can trust him. We can trust him. Now, this does raise the question, well, what, what about suffering? Certainly God's people have suffered in the Bible, have suffered throughout history. Where is God when that happens? God is always near and always in the suffering with us. I mean, one passage that comes to mind is, is Romans 8. What should separate us from the love of God? And then Paul lists all these things that could separate us. All these challenges. All these difficulties. Say nothing. Nothing can sever you from God's watchful care. It doesn't mean you'll be immune to difficulty, but as we go through it, His watchful, protective care will be with us. You can trust Him. Not only can we be confident in His care, but we can be absolutely 100% certain of His care, which brings us to the final point. We can be certain of the Lord's protective care all of our days. All of your days, you can trust Him. The Lord, verse 7, will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. That was true the first moment you called out to Jesus, and it will be true of your final breath. The Lord will guard and protect you from all evil. Look at verse 7 again. The Lord will keep you. The Lord who is mighty and strong, all wise and all knowing and all loving. He will keep you. He will keep your life. As a fan, I like to watch cross country. As uh, an exerciser, I like to ride bikes. And one of the things you learn around western Pennsylvania is cars usually are not the biggest threat on at least for me, when you're riding a bike. It's dogs. So you begin to know places by their dogs. So I was up in the northern end of our county with my friend Ray, and he, he, we came upon a house, and he went like this, which meant stop talking. <laughs> and we slowly ride by, and sure enough, there's this big German shepherd watching over his master's property right on the front porch and just intimidating the daylights out of us. But the owners have him to watch, to protect. And sure enough, morning or evening, he's out there watching and protecting. He's doing his job. He's doing the job his owners want him to do. In a far greater scale, think of your family. The Lord is watching in a more attentive way, in a more loving way, definitely, than that German shepherd. But he is watching with great love and great compassion. And that watchfulness, it never stops. So are you fearful? Are you worried? Are you anxious? Go to the one who never stops watching, never stops caring, never stops working for your good. The Lord will extend his protective care now and forever into eternity. Verse 8. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. There are incredible truths in Psalm 121. So the question is, what do we do with this? How do we respond? When I was a senior in college, I, I was kind of done with my major, so I got to take some filler classes. One of the classes I took was a pottery class. And I had some modest goals. I wanted to make a couple of coffee mugs and a soup bowl. 
and mission was accomplished. I'm not artistic, but the thing I learned very quickly is the key to spinning pottery on a pottery wheel is you have to center the clay. If it is not centered, you will never get a bowl or a mug that is symmetrical in any way. It just won't happen. Well, this psalm, in many ways, is God calling to us to center our heart, our affection, our mind, our will on Him. And so it really should be a a call, an evaluation. Where is my mind? Where is my heart? Where are my affections? Am I that tired runner who is just so inside of themselves that I need the voice of Coach Peter to say, eyes up, look up, look up, I'm here. We saw in this psalm this big idea that since the Lord is our hope and our help, we must look to Him for his watchful care and protection. It's one thing to know, it's another thing to do it. So what will you do? Here's what I suggest. This week, this Thanksgiving week, spend time in Psalm 121. Spend 15 minutes each morning reading and praying and thinking through verses 1 through 8. Ask the Lord for conviction where there's unbelief, where there's doubt, where there's fear. Ask the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit to to give you the gift of repentance where you can turn from that. And as you turn, then call to the Lord in fresh faith. Declare your trust in Him. That He is who He says He is in this psalm. He is the one watching. He is the one who never sleeps. He is the one whose gaze is upon us. Every single one of our days. Look to Him. And as we're heading in Thanksgiving, thank Him for His care. Thank Him that if you have called on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He will keep you to that very final day where you cross into eternity. You can trust Him. If you haven't called on Him, today is the day to call on Him and get under His shade and protection. We saw this morning these three truths from this passage. And they are this. We must look to the Lord for our care and protection. When we do that, we can be confident in the Lord's protective care. And then lastly, we saw we can be certain. We can be certain of the Lord's protective care all of our days. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that these words are true. Thank you that you are near to us when we call to you. And thank you there is no situation that is outside of your gaze and your care. And so we surrender to you. We look to you for help and hope. And we thank you that you love us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.